Hello, this is Amy Swank, Vice President of the Texas Economic Development Council. I'd like to introduce our next session, Small Business is Big Economic Development. We have three panelists today, starting with Anatolio Labaldi. Anatolio is CEO of Size Up and Managing Director and Co-Founder of GIS Planning. Also joining us today is Mark Hayes. Mark Hayes is Director of Business Development at Size Up. Also joining us is Sandy Pratt. Sandy is Vice President of Underpinned. Thank you so much, Amy, and welcome everybody this morning. I'm going to be starting things off by giving content about this issue of the opportunity of small business. And then that's going to be followed by Sandy and Mark really talking about some concrete solutions of what you can do in your communities. For all of us, please feel free to reach out. We're here. We're happy to help, certainly live, but we're also happy to follow up with any questions that you may have after the webinar. So let's get started with a little bit of context of what's going on with all of you as economic developers and where your priorities are as it relates to small business. There is a survey, most recent survey done about this, and it's quite interesting. Within this context of what we're all going through right now, which is this issue of the challenges related to coronavirus, economic developers have put assisting local businesses far out ahead in terms of what is their number one priority. In fact, everything but that almost becomes a rounding error in the big picture. And certainly these small businesses, your local businesses, are those who are wanting help from you as economic developers. For your organizations, there's this question of what matters to you. For all of you, just kind of think in your head, what are the priorities that whether it's your, your city council, your board of directors, or the managers and directors of your organization have as a priority? Think about what it is for you. Now, when we look at what this is for most economic developers, job creation always comes up as the number one priority. Now, I'm not saying that this should be. I'm just saying statistically, this is what the situation is. So if we're thinking about jobs, if there was a way, if there was some magical silver bullet where you could increase job creation by over 400%, this would probably be a reason you would want to change or adjust or focus your priorities in your budget. And I am going to tell you how you can do that. But first, what I'm going to do is talk about small business and the big impact that they have on your communities. I'm going to use data to show you the evidence. So what we know is that in the U.S. economy, small businesses are about half of the GDP and about half for the larger companies. But in your local economy, there's a greater economic impact from local small businesses. There are numerous studies which show this. I'll share with you one that comes from civics economics. And they said, if you have $100 in your local economy, the total impact is significantly higher with local independents than they are for chain competitors. So another study from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and you see the secondary spending with local independents is also much higher than big box chains. Why? Again, it's the recycling, the economic multiplier of dollars in your community. You also look at job creation and you see the vast majority of jobs come from small businesses. And if you look at it over time, let's look at this issue of what happens when there's a recession. This is total job creation and you can see small businesses came out of the last recession much faster. When we look at it at net job creation, it's a, you see a similar thing where it's small businesses that bounce back faster. I said that I was going to tell you how you can increase job creation by over 400% and I'm going to show you exactly how to do that now. So let's look at this data. This compares small and large businesses over time from 1993 to 2000, and it's actually 16, which is the last year that we have really good quality data because federal data lags. But the point is, is that tracking net new jobs over this time period, small businesses created 425% more jobs than big businesses. So let's think about it this way. With your economic development organization, if you decided I'm going to focus only on large businesses, or I'm only going to focus on small businesses. Back in 1993, you would outperform an economic development organization that only focused on large businesses by over 400% if you focused on small business. Another element of small business is entrepreneurship. And we're really in a context right now of where there's going to be two types. It's the voluntary and involuntary. So there are plenty of people who've been at home or during the lockdown or they've, you know, whatever the situation is, and they've been thinking about, as many do, dreaming about their American dream of being their own boss, owning their own business. 
However, there's also a number of people who are going to be forced into entrepreneurship because they've lost their job. They may not have another opportunity or option other than to start their own business. As we think about where the new jobs are going to come from, coming out of COVID, out of the recession, what are the opportunities? First, what I'd like to do is I'd like to step outside of our profession of economic development and say, if we looked back and I told you on the 23rd of March of 2020, that if you put money in, you could see you could nearly double your money. You'd want to have invested at that moment because just an incredible opportunity. So that's at a personal level. Let's look at what this relates to trends in economic development. And what I share with you, I think is going to blow your mind, but it's going to take a little bit of time for me to explain the nuance before this becomes clear. So this first First chart that I'm showing you actually looks at new businesses. So these are businesses that are registering to open in the United States. And what you can see is during the last recession, there was a general trend downward, but of course it's also cyclical. You can see though, look what happened in this recession. Of course, as coronavirus hit and there were closings, it was pretty bad, right? There was a decrease, but then there's a massive spike that happened. Now, if you look at this, you say, okay, this massive spike was followed by a decrease. But I want to point out this decrease is still higher than at any point that we've seen in recent history. I'm going to make the case for you that in fact, this is such a huge opportunity for economic developers. But in some ways, because this data is aggregated, it might be tricking us a little bit. What really happens is, is that there are different quarters. By fiscal quarter, businesses open more or less. You can actually see Q4 of almost every year, with the exception of, you can see there was a, a big downturn. This was the, the last recession in Q1. But generally, the fourth quarter is the quarter that the new businesses open the least, followed by Q3, Q2, and Q1. So let's see what happened after 2019. Look at this. Green is Q3, massive, massive spike. Q4, massive spike. And if we assume that this trend continues, Q1, which is usually the best quarter, who knows what that's going to be this year, but it could be very significant. I bring this to your attention because this may be a once in a career opportunity for us as economic developers to take advantage of this trend of businesses opening. And the way that we support entrepreneurs can have a huge impact. Let's look at this another way, which is where are you getting your best return on investment from job creation? For this, the federal government breaks uh, businesses into certain chunks. There's a chunk that they look at that are businesses from started in 1975 or earlier. Year. Then there's from 76 to 2015, and then 2016, which is the year that we have the most recent data. And what you'll see is relative to the share of all businesses, the top job creators are those that were started before 1975. So their relative performance is 153%. But the big opportunity is the brand new businesses. Relative to their share of all businesses, they're creating 245% of relative performance. I want to wrap things up with four big, which are also connected trends impact us as economic developers. The first, obviously, is, is a huge one. When you think about all of the trends that are going on, that are being talked about at the state, local, and national levels, COVID is, is really a huge impact. And what we're seeing is, is that there's massive business closures. Many of the temporary closures are now permanent. So you see 60% of those are now permanent. There's 800 small business closures every day, according to Yelp. But UC Santa Cruz research shows that it's actually basically double that. This is having a huge impact. Now, we don't have the exact data because federal data always lags. This is some of the good research that's coming out. The other issue is that small businesses are looking for government support. And also, many of them weren't profitable last year. So that puts them in a more difficult position of surviving this year. Second major trend is that job creation no longer requires business attraction. So many of us, myself included, we grew up in a profession where so much of what we did was focused around getting jobs in our community from somewhere else. But in fact, that is not the reality anymore. And if we go back to really the, the core, the fundamentals or foundation of economic development, it was the Mississippi model. And that was industrial development, where you go to other states, you say, we're low cost, come here. But that doesn't work that well anymore because one, there's tons of places, we're in a global economy and there's plenty of places that are cheaper than any of our communities and it doesn't matter if you're the cheapest community in the United States. It doesn't matter if you are the most affordable location in Texas because there's always somewhere, somewhere else that is more affordable. The new model in economic development is really about expansion of the businesses that are in your communities, focusing on entrepreneurship and workforce. Third major trend is economic inclusion. What we're seeing is, is there's become, is becoming a huge bifurcation between the haves and have-nots. 
if you look at these charts, you see these folks here are just one fifth of all of the incomes, but the top 5% makes four times as much as people who are relatively affluent in the fourth fifth of income. And look at what's going on. These people are in all of our communities, right? There are poor and rich in our community, but there's certainly a lot more of the folks who are making less. We also see that there is a big difference between men and women's income. This is again, both full time and full year. We also see this as a hollowing out of the middle class. Middle income has been decreasing. Lower income, the amount of aggregate income they have has also reduced, but look at upper income. So you see this massive shift of wealth. And let's look at this concentration. The top 1% has 39% of all wealth. Then you take the next 9%, it's 39%. So the top 10% has all the wealth except for 23%, which is shared by the bottom quarter. How does this relate to small businesses? What we know is for minority businesses, specifically black small businesses, they were hardest hit by COVID. They also disproportionately in a bad way, didn't get the PPP funds. As they applied, they got less than others. So this is something you need to consider for your communities. Another major trend is digitization. A lot of economic developers may have said, okay, well, our digital transformation, we can deal with this in the future. But the reality is, is COVID has caused this massive acceleration where economic developers are now having to take projects that they plan to do in two, three years and compress them into two or three months, or certainly maybe two fiscal quarters. We can see that from the survey, which showed how do you change your economic development work? The third and fourth highest ranking thing. So number one was local businesses. Two was increased community relations. But three and four was both the technology you need to do your work and the technology you need to be able to serve your customers. So very high priority. As we think about how to help small businesses and entrepreneurs in this perhaps career opportunity like we've never seen before, the solution is actually pretty simple. It's about your investment in local small businesses and entrepreneurs. However, success is simple, but it's not necessarily easy. And for the how to do this, I'm going to turn it over to Sandy. Some great information from Antalio. Thank you so much for that. Sandy Pratt, and excited to be here with the Texas Economic Development Council group. So Antalio shared some great data and information on trends and what we're seeing with small business and entrepreneurs and some forecasts. I want to focus on talking about what cities, economic development organizations, and universities are doing across the U.S. to support small business and focus on entrepreneurs. I, I love this thought or statement from Kaufman. I want to share that with you. It ties back to what Antonio said as well, that the pandemic has reminded us of the importance of small business and the impact they have on the employment within the U.S., employing 47% of the U.S. workforce based on these stats, and generating two-thirds of, of the new jobs and serving as a critical path for economic self-sufficiency. So, and then we as economic developers and cities and uh, organizations understand the impact of small business and the priority and importance of focusing on that. This survey by um, GGB Capital and, and Hello Alice was very inspiring for me because it, it surveyed small business owners, over 4,000 of them. And what I, what I really want to share is the optimism that these small businesses shared about the future. 83% uh, believe that their business will perform better this year. 93% are planning to hire, and compared to the 45% that laid off employees last year, it's significant. 75% uh, intend to spend more on technology in 2021, and to note that 75% of, of those businesses surveyed utilized government emergency grants, long-term grants, and rent relief. However, only 52% applied for the payroll protection program, and they cited reasons for that were due to lack of access or focus on small businesses enterprises. So uh, it's inspiring to see the optimism from the small business community. Most of us, or many of us, have members that are either veterans of the military or active military. Uh, this next program I'm going to talk about is really focused on supporting those entrepreneurs and small businesses from that sector of our nation. The uh, some stats related to the veterans, 20, more than 21 million uh, veteran-owned veteran small business enterprises in the U.S., they employ 5.8 million people and former service members, no surprise here, but are 45% more likely to own small businesses than non-veterans because they are entrepreneurial and more risk takers. And there is one veteran-owned firm to every 10 veterans in the U.S. Uh, impressive numbers there with the impact uh, to, our, to our nation for entrepreneurs. 
So I want to highlight Bunker Labs, which is a program, it's an incubator program that is focused on serving veterans. Um, veterans active military, fewer entrepreneurs or have small businesses they want to grow. It was launched in 2014 and focused on active duty and veteran entrepreneurs, created close to 2,000 jobs for the veteran and startups that have gone through the program. Uh, it is a six-month business incubator program. Oh, and I didn't, I didn't mention that Bunker Labs has partnered with WeWork for this initiative, so really two strong, very strong partners. Over 700 veteran-owned businesses have participated. 89% uh, of those have accelerated growth. 38% have added employees. 23% have raised funding within the first the one to six month time frame, which is very impressive for entrepreneurs and startups. They just launched this year's cohort in January, uh, and they have 179 companies in the cohort that are located across the U.S. with the different bunker locations across the, uh, the U.S. I went through those businesses and looked at the types of companies that they were seeing that are, that are in this year's cohort. And uh, great industry sectors diverse from technology to health sciences, IT, marketing, construction, industrial products, uh, defense and space consulting, of course, industrial uh, financial services, health and fitness, occupational therapy are just a few that I saw, but really diverse. And it's exciting to see all those different close to 180 uh, companies or startups working throughout the U.S. with these individuals. They do a muster across America conference each year for these entrepreneurs and startups to network with experts and connectors throughout the U.S. and also to pitch their, their business, their small business. So a great opportunity for them to, to do that nationally. And they just launched another tool this year that is focused, it's a virtual tool for financial management and design thinking, looking at the changes that we've seen as a result of COVID and kind of taking their uh, services to the next level. When you think about economic development organizations that are involved in working with small businesses, I noted that the Lafayette, Louisiana Economic Development Authority and their Opportunity Machine Center, which is uh, an entrepreneurship center, just partnered to bring a bunker lab to their region. So um, still very active, new locations coming online, and a really great resource for our focus on that sector of our nation. Next, I want to highlight this really fun program in Akron, Ohio. It is the Akronite app, and you can read my Let the Blip Guide You to a New Spot. So the city of Akron uh, wanted to put in place something to help their small businesses uh, to, to grow and expand, and also during the COVID pandemic timeframe. So they, um, they started a shop local for economic recovery program using an app. They developed this new app. It is called the, uh, the Akronite Blimp, the Akronite app. The Blimp ties back to, that's a nod back to Goodyear, the Goodyear Blimp, because Goodyear is headquartered in Akron, Ohio. I love that it's tied back to a, a local company. Uh, they've had great success. To date, they have 170 businesses that are using the app and over 4,000 shoppers, I call them, who have signed up to, uh, to shop and do business with these uh, companies that are on the app. I asked, how is this funded? I was curious how a municipality was funding uh, the incentive piece of this. They used the CARES Act uh, to fund this, to create the app and to pay the incentives to those shoppers who are shopping with these local businesses. And they um, plan to keep those incentives in place through the end of 2022. So they want to make sure that it is impactful to their small businesses. Uh, the way it works is every purchase earns a blimp, a $1 blimp credit for future purchases. And the other thing that's really great is they emphasize this program by providing uh, 15, 10 to 15% in additional rewards to shoppers who do business with black-owned small businesses as well, which we know is such a priority. And shoppers can save up to 30% on their purchases, this significant amount. And it's also coincided with a reopening of their main street, which had been under some construction activity for a couple of years. So I'm sure this is a tremendous surge for all those small businesses. And the app also has other information, destinations, local stories. So uh, just a really great story and, uh, and, and pleased to share that one with you today. The next one is an accelerator program in Surprise, Arizona, AZ Tech. Some of you may know Janine there that, that runs that program. Awesome team, really high energy, very innovative, uh, aggressive with their small business and international uh, business as well. They have a 60,000 square foot facility that was previously a, a city hall, 
complex. It's been repurposed for that. They've turned it into a really fun environment. One thing I noted is um, they've added some elements of play. They have uh, an elevator that they've wrapped with the TARDIS Doctor Who phone boot that uh, takes you up to upper levels of the building. That pool table, golf. Uh, they named rooms after famous people, the Alex Trebek room, and just have a lot of fun and creative environment to help these help these entrepreneurs think and innovate. They offer a global concierge program and they are one of 31 members of eight countries accepted into the International Business Incubator Association's Global Soft Landing Network. And in order to get into that program, uh, they have a pretty aggressive list of criteria that you have to be able to provide to your companies. And examples are um, validated, they have to have um, translation, language training, market research and entry, access to capital, investors, capital and investors, intellectual property, help with government regulations, help with patents, business licenses, cultural training, immigration, and visa assistance, and also housing assistance. So those are the types of things these uh, organizations across the world um, went through to become part of this program. And fortunately, AZ Tech is, is one of those. Some news that just happened in the last month was the AZ Tech Accelerator entered into a partnership with a global partner in Germany. It's 5HT Digital Hub Chemistry and Health Hub in Germany. Uh, they focus on digital innovation in chemical and healthcare and industry. So awesome partnership, both directions for them to um, work with entrepreneurs and startups. And that's, that's one of two partnerships. They're, they're announcing another one soon. And the last thing here that I think is really fun is um, they're focused on youth and if youth that are very entrepreneurial. We all want to instill these values in our children when they're younger and especially as teenagers. And what they have is a youth boot camp program where they, they host about 20 students a year in the summer. And they ask these students to develop a business idea around a need in their community and, and build a business plan and a model around that and then, and then pitch it. Um, so I love the concept that it's focused on something that would be helpful and, and value uh, to address a community need. The thing that I thought was really unique is to help, they provide a lot of expertise, of course, with startup, startup type resources and how to, but because one of the challenges with, um, with everyone at times, but especially with younger, uh, you know, younger population is having the skill sets to promote your business, do a pitch to sell your business and your product. So they have an improv person who comes in and makes this really fun, gets the, the youth opening up and really talking and sharing, and basically coaches them on pitching. And then at the end of the program, they pitch. They pitch their, their business. And um, the, the one that's selected has a, gets an award, and the others all get something as well. So this is a really cool program. I'm really excited to talk about that one. The next one is Saginaw Future. And this is in Saginaw, Michigan. It's a county economic development organization. And it is a, uh, a really strong, excellent staff and team doing economic development there in that county. They also are the lead for collaborative work that happens with the region that they are in. They are in an eight county region, which is one of the numerous regions that are designated in Michigan. And so they kind of serve as the lead to bring those groups together and collaborate on projects. The um, Saginaw County, Michigan group has always had a focus, a heavy focus on small business, and they even enhanced that in the last year plus. Um, part of what they do in their partnership is, uh, their partnership with the multi-county region, is they pursue grant dollars every year, and they've been successful in getting grants to help with various business needs and economic development efforts, and they were successful in getting uh, three and a half million this year. So one of the things they put together, of course, many cities and medias did, was a reopening playbook for small business to help them in response to COVID and how to recover and resources that are available for, available for them as well. But one thing they did um, was they they implemented Size Up, which uh, Mark will talk more about that later, uh, and Antonio touched on that as well. Is they utilized some of the grant dollars to invest in Size Up and added that that resource to their website. So what Size Up did for that small business sector, per se, is uh, what, what Saginaw, Michigan saw was, you know, what, what started as a startup tool turned into a pandemic uh, restart tool. So businesses were using this to identify their target geographic markets, 
where those opportunities were for their products, their demographic markets, who's their target audience, where are they located at, how do we access them? And the other side of that is some of these businesses had, of course, laid off people or had downsized, so they were having to look at new models on how to operate their business successfully financially, and size up helps them do that. Uh, you know, if they reduce staff, they need their sales level to be at a certain volume. You know, what are our operating costs? What's our market? It will help those businesses evaluate that and help them with direction on, on where do we go from here and how do we, you know, how do we, how do we recover and how do we get back on track? So that's it. This really helped uh, with their small business focus. It's been a great program for them, and they um, they were able to get that implemented in many of the other counties in their eight county region as well. So it's something that's really widespread supporting small business in their region. And the last one is a university-related venture capital group. This is UC Davis in Davis, California, which is located just west of Sacramento. UC Davis is known for its worldwide leadership in research and innovation. Uh, the VC Catalyst was established to provide resources to campus entrepreneurs. So it is really focused on the students and the and faculty and others and entrepreneurs that are at the campus. Their sector focuses are biomedical and health and human health, engineering and tech, agriculture and animal health. To date, uh, there have been 122 startups uh, go through the program that have created over 1,200 jobs. They've been averaging about 14 startups per year for the past six years, but they've seen acceleration in that recently. And over two-thirds of the start, two-thirds of those startups are in biomedical and human health services, which is not surprising for what for recent years, but also what we're seeing now. They've done impressive work in on the revenue side and funding for um, you know their entrepreneurs. 24.5 million uh, revenue in 2018, 372 million in angel and capital uh, venture capital investors, 21.5 million in SBIR and STTR funding, uh, close to 900 million in other funding, and then 1.8 million from the venture capital proof of concept grant. What is most impressive to me is this last statistic is the 70% of UC Davis startups are still active. It's an impressive number for small business and startups. So great program and, and pleased to talk about that. So with that, uh, thank you very much. I hope that you've found some of the information. Um, there's a tidbit that you can take back and implement in your own programs or, or some ideas that you can consider for your work with small business in, in your economic development efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy. I appreciate you passing that along to me. Some great information from both you and Anatolio. I am excited to be here with everybody this morning. I'm excited for economic development in general for one reason in particular, and it's because in the last year, I have watched economic development really shift and really transition into helping small businesses. Uh, nobody saw 2020 coming. Uh, we weren't necessarily prepared for any of it, and probably that speaks to all of us. But what I noticed is economic developers said, you know what, small businesses need help right now. And I watched them across the country stop everything they normally did and said, I'm going to help small business. I may not know what I need to do, but I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to watch small businesses get better. I'm going to help them through this. And throughout the last year, I've watched economic developers just continue to focus on small business and not just get to business as usual. Um, unfortunately, you've had to do both business as usual and helping economic or help small businesses. But it's been something that's been amazing to watch. And I've watched them not just say, hey, when pandemic ends, it was great working with you. See you later. But they've started to implement things that are going to help small businesses going forward. Uh, it's transitioned to economic development and to being really as great as it can be because small businesses are in jeopardy. And small businesses, quite frankly, before 2020, have been in jeopardy. So I'm gonna go over a little bit what we can do to help them, right, and why they're such a big deal. And speaking of small businesses being in jeopardy, let's play some small business jeopardy. So da -da -da -da. I didn't record the music, so you'll have to use my voice there. But we're gonna play some small business jeopardy, and I'd love for you to play along. We're gonna have some questions. Some are pretty easy, lower dollars, some are pretty high. Full disclosure, I won't know if you get every one of them wrong. Also won't know if you get it right, and there is no money to be had here. But let's learn a little bit about small businesses and what a big deal they are to communities and to economic development in particular. So the first question is, the percentage of all businesses in the USA that are small businesses, bing, what is 99.9%? .9 that was an easy one. That was a 200 question. I know a lot of people probably guess 99%. And I think we're going to count that one. Um, and I hear people saying like, okay, but what are we defining as a small business? And the SBA 
uh, defines a small business as under 500 employees, which I know a lot of people in Texas are saying, well, that's a giant business in my community. And I think that's completely fair. So let's go to the next question. The percentage of US small businesses with 20 or less employees, what is 89%? That's still a giant number. So the heavy, heavy, heavy majority of small businesses even are under 20 employees. So everyone in any community is going to agree 20 employees is a small business and 89% of those businesses are small. The percentage of all jobs created by small businesses, what is 64%? So of all the jobs out there, 64% of jobs are created by small businesses. And as Anatalia said in his slides, the priority of most economic developers is to create new jobs, is to create jobs and help jobs. So 64% of them are coming from small businesses. That's a big piece of your job. How much more likely are millennials and Gen Zers, if that is a word, but I'm going to coin it here, Gen Zers to start a side hustle than baby boomers? This is a tough one. And if you got it right, what is 188%? Millennials and Gen Zers are 188% more likely to start a side hustle than baby boomers. Why is that important? Well, if 64% of jobs are already coming from small businesses, well, millennials, they're starting to be the ones to create those businesses and open businesses, but Gen Zers haven't yet. If they're 188% more likely to start a side hustle or to create a business, in other words, then that 64% of jobs that small businesses are creating, well, that number is going to skyrocket. That's probably the lowest it's ever going to be because we're watching millennials and Gen Zers start businesses at a much higher rate. It's something we have to be paying attention to right now. As much as we get irritated by Gen Zers, they are the future and we need to make sure that we're fostering the businesses they're going to create. What percentage of small businesses fail in their first year? That's not a very fun one. What is 20%. So 20% of small businesses fail in their first year. Why is that important? Well, as Anatolia pointed out in his slides, we're going to see an explosion of small businesses starting. And we have seen them. Data is starting to catch up on that. There've been a lot of licenses applied for. So we're going to see an explosion of small businesses. Well, before COVID, 20% of small businesses were likely to fail in their first year. During COVID, that number obviously went way higher, but that's going to be probably a pretty much a standard. It has been over the last couple decades. So that's a lot of jobs we're losing just in that first year and we need to be able to help them. Then lastly, what percentage of small businesses that fail in their first five years? And what is 50%? We're losing half of these businesses in the first five years. That's that's a lot of jobs and it's a lot of businesses and it's huge to an economy. Now, the way to reduce the failure rate of small businesses... What is, well, I'm gonna have to do an entire slide for this, and this is going to be the longest answer in Jeopardy history. Uh, this is your daily double, we'll call it. So, the fair rate, why it matters, and what you as an economic developer can do. The fair rate in year one, we, we've already discussed, is 20%, and that's on the low end, I will say. You see a lot of different data about this, and I'm trying to be conservative here. And by year five, 50% of businesses fail. So we're going to do a little math here, and if you don't love math, I'll do it for you. So the failure rate in year one, 20%. So what's the rate per year here? Well, there's another 30% that's shared between rates or years two, three, four, and five. Well, all we have to do is take that 30%, divide it by those four years, two, three, four, and five, and that's an average of 7.5% fail rate per year in years two, three, four, and five. Why does that matter? Well, because we're just going to use that as just like, hey, things happen, and 7.5% of businesses is what you should expect to lose year in and year out. But in year one, we're losing at least 20% of our businesses. So that natural causes, which again, super conservative, we're giving it credit uh, when you probably could help these things, but we'll just say you couldn't help it. 7.5% are losing, but 12.5% are being lost because they weren't prepared. They weren't ready with information to help them succeed. And most of the time, it's because this information is not out there. It does not exist. These people need help, and those businesses could have succeeded. They could have thrived, but they didn't get the help they needed. Economic developers can step in and be that help, okay? You can get out of that bottom one-eighth if you simply get the resources that you need, and you will be more likely to succeed. You'll be on that 80% side in year one. Once again, I can't stress enough, 
there's a boom in business starts right now. It's so important in terms of having jobs in your community to keep these small businesses that are starting out of the pandemic. So I'm going to do a bit of an analogy here and we're going to be farmers instead of economic developers. And I'm gonna just kind of illustrate how economic development is done if it were in farming. So we have this field of corn. Our corn out here, that's the jobs that are out there, the businesses that are out there. And we have this field and somebody comes in and they tell us, you know what? We need more corn. Got to have more corn. Uh, it's just we're, our people are demanding more. We need more for our community. So, you know, the obvious is, as I say, we just need to make another field. Let's get another field and let's clear it out. Let's plow it and let's hope that it produces more crops. We don't necessarily know that it will, but what else could we do, right? This field's not enough. We need to make another field. Well, we bring in a consultant to give us the answers that are obvious. And the consultant says, yeah, you could have another field to create more corn, have more yield. But I've noticed in just the first few months here, 20% of your field is dying. Uh, you could actually have much more yield if you simply fostered your cornfield that was already there. But we, you know, as a consultant, I expect some of your crop is going to die. Things happen. Uh, maybe you create a corn maze in the fall. I don't know, but some of your crop is going to die, which is about 7.5%. This is what I expect, yet this is the amount that was dying. So if we could just foster the field we already have, the jobs, then we could actually create more simply by saving the ones that are already there. And all they need is more access to tools and information that we readily make available to the bigger businesses. Small businesses struggle to find that. So as farmers, we can create more jobs by keep, or I'm sorry, create more crops by keeping more crops. So I think everybody understood that analogy enough. Fix the lack of preparation, save small businesses. So examples of why businesses fail. Um, these are real numbers, but businesses don't do their research to prepare to be in business. Uh, and a lot of, you know, some of that might be due to they just didn't on their own, but they don't know there's information out there or there just isn't information out there. 42% of small businesses fail in that first year because there's not a market. You can find that information out. 19% get out competed. Quite frankly, a lot of that competition comes from our industry when we bring competitors in who are much bigger and have much more resources and we even provide more for them and they out compete our smaller businesses. And then 14% is bad marketing. That's an easy fix. And then people retire in later years. I point these things out because they're things economic developers can actually help with. And I've noticed in the last year especially, but in the last 10, it's really started to become a smaller trend. But economic developers are figuring out how to help. But there's a big problem that some of you are thinking right now, and that's how do I scale myself to help every business? I, do, you know, I have a business retention and expansion program, but... I can only visit so many businesses a year. I have a goal of visiting 40 of them or 50 of them. How could I possibly visit every small business to figure out their needs? There's too many of them out there and I couldn't agree with you more. You don't have enough staff for it. You don't have enough resources for it. You can make yourself more scalable. And how do you make yourself more scalable and how do you get ge around geographical boundaries? How do you get around, you know, I said I'm not gonna make this about COVID, but how do we get around COVID to where we can't be face-to-face -face and it's hard to get in touch with people and we don't know exactly what to do? Well, there's online training out there and there are online research tools. There are specific tools designed to help small businesses. And that's really what my focus is. That's what I've been helping economic developers with all the time. And that's what's been discussed within this entire, uh, at least on this panel and probably within the conference, that digital is a solution. So you want examples? I'm going to show you examples. I like to think there are three types of economic development uh, websites out there and how they help small businesses. The first type of economic developer, which is getting fewer and fewer every day, but they still exist. You get on that economic development website as a small business and you find nothing at all. Uh, sorry, we're here for business attraction, but we would love to refer you to the local chamber or the local SBDC or the local XYZ. But what you're really saying is, we just don't help small businesses because we don't have the time or we don't have the energy, the interest, or we didn't know that there is a way to help you without having to dedicate staff to it. There are digital solutions. So if you're one of these that do nothing, you can continue to not dedicate any time towards helping small business, but you can add things to your website so that they can help small businesses. No reason the nothing economic development small business help should exist. The second one is the Click website. And the Click website, I see a lot of these. And there are people listening right now who are one of the Click websites. And what is a Click website? Click website is you click a button that has, it's a cool button that says small business assistance. 
and then there are a bunch of links. So I click on a link and I'm like, okay, yeah, business planning tools. Let's look at business startup basics. Okay, there's a multiple other selections here that I can click on that are hyperlinks. Okay, let's click on this one for the entrepreneur guide. And now there's three more hyperlinks I can click on. And by the time I've got here, I'm usually not on the economic development website anymore and I really don't know how to get back to where I was and I get frustrated. Even as a non, you know, even if somebody who's not the small business trying to help a community, but I look at economic development websites and I literally like, where did I go? I'm on five different websites and I haven't found any help. I appreciate the effort, but it's not that helpful. The third type of economic development website, there's an A and a B. And the A, I, I applaud them. They're the ones who said, I'm going to invest in software. I'm going to invest in digital solutions that are going to help people that visit my website. But some of them are just the power user websites. You get these power user tools that maybe there's only a certain amount of subscription, so only I can use it internally. Well, that doesn't help the scalability problem of how do I help every business in my community? It needs to be open for everyone to use and it needs to be available 24 seven, but it also needs to be easy to use. There are a lot of tools out there, but you look at them and you are on this chalkboard just writing numbers down, trying to you know, be somebody to figure out how to use the most complicated tool there is available. That doesn't help small businesses. And I can prove that with data that the percent of small businesses that say their top priority for using new technology is ease of use. These are the people that said all the things they could say why they would use technology. The top priority is it needs to be easy for them to use. And that is 69% of small businesses agree. If it's not easy to use, I'm done with it. I'm not going to try. So I applaud you all that have only the power user tools, but they're probably not getting used because small businesses are giving up on it pretty quick. The 3B is the economic developer who invests in digital, who puts things on their website that are user friendly and they're built specifically for small businesses. And they are actually provided by the economic development organization, not just 10 links that go to another website that might do something that Let's be honest, those links that you're sending people to, you probably have no idea what's there. You just put them on there because someone said, hey, there's a small business resource. You don't know what it is or what it does. Um, so there are websites out there and I've seen many of them that have started to invest in these tools, but quite frankly, there aren't many of them. There are very few tools that are built for the small business to use and understand without any background in data or market research. And we can take a closer look at one. So I will switch my screen over to share uh, we'll look at a live website. So here we are looking at a live economic development website to show you exactly how other communities, one in particular, Colorado Springs Chamber and EDC, it's a beautiful website. And I'm just gonna show you quickly a few things on it. A, it's pretty simple. What you can easily find what you're looking for. There's a lot of information here, but it's not just a conglomeration of different links, right? It's just showing you about the community. It has just a couple links here say, you know what, I wanna do business. That's exactly what I wanna do as a small business. Okay, is there anything there for me? There are things there for larger business. If I want to know about opportunity zones, incentives and taxes, property search, this is a tool that's going to be for the power user. And there's also tools that are built for the small business. This one in particular, um, like Sandy talked a little bit about for Michigan, it's going to just help the small business help themselves. You don't have to invest any time into this. All the user has to do is know what it is they do and where it is they do it at. So I'm a coffee shop. I'm in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I want to benchmark myself against others who do exactly what I do. It's going to allow you to benchmark yourselves against others. How much revenue did I make last year? I made a half a million dollars. Well, is that good, bad, or somewhere in between? Or I'm starting a coffee shop. Can I make $500,000 a year? Well, you absolutely can. The data suggesting in Colorado Springs, you're making $720,000 per year. That's a number that you could probably definitely achieve. And we're seeing where we stand versus others. We've got heat maps to show us, right? Maybe numbers aren't what I'm good at, but I can look at a heat map and say, this is the area where businesses are performing the best. We can find out where our competitors are. We can find out where our potential business customers are. We can find out where our suppliers are. I'm looking for new supply chain. It got interrupted last year. Where are my suppliers within the region? So if I was at coffee shop we talked about, I'm looking for coffee and tea wholesale. Now it's going to find every single potential supplier closest to me and then within the region. I didn't even know there was one here located in Castle Rock but there's a coffee shop, there's their name, there's their phone number, there's their address, their website. I can check out potential suppliers. It's going to give me best places to advertise based off of my specific industry and I didn't have to, to click on anything. Just click advertise and it's going to tell you that information based off total revenues or based off revenue per capita or 
underserved markets. And then there's demographic information and not just basic demographic information that, you know, this might be what we normally see on a website is the total demographics. And here's where those, what those people look like. We can find exactly where they are. So where are those millennials? Where are those 20 to 29 year olds or the 30 to 39 year olds? Let's find out the neighborhoods that have the densest populations of this specific group. So you're getting heat maps that are just so easy to look at and understand. And guess what? I've identified a bunch of 20 to 29 year olds right there in these neighborhoods around South Murray Boulevard. Super easy to use. You can get information and you can get it on your own. Right now, this economic developer, they helped a small business. They helped me as a small business and they had no idea they did. Guess what, we got to do it in the background. I gave them the same information that you all are used to supplying to big businesses right here for a small business. I'm gonna stop there because I, I, I may have talked longer than I was supposed to, but I want to do some question and answer with everybody. Join us for live Q&A with the presenters next up on the conference program.